In just 20 minutes, I'll teach you how to build a complete Geometry Dash game. And no, this is not clickbait. In fact, we will be building a complete level filled with physics, explosions, animations, and even the awesome ship mode all here on Scratch. Without further ado, let's jump right into it. Before we begin, I'd recommend you download my starter file, which you can find down from the link in the description. This will contain all the game assets and images, so that will save you a lot of trouble of drawing each sprite. There is a final sprite called All Obstacles, which contains my custom level. The costumes here contain the floors where the player can land on, the visible obstacles which kill the player, as well as the pink invisible obstacles where the player would basically crash to his death. Each of these costumes are in separate sprites, but this is for your understanding. Let's begin coding. At the start, you should see the player as well as the flow sprite that's visible on the screen. The first thing we'll have to do is set up the jumping script. Go onto the stage sprite and here, when the green flag is clicked, first broadcast a new message called init and wait, and then broadcast a new message called start game and then wait. On receiving init, stop all the sounds and then start the music. Now we have to create the main variables that we'll use throughout our game. First, create one called scroll x, then game over, then background color, then mode, then score, and finally player 1. Set scroll x to 0 and then both the game over and player 1 variables to no. The background color variable will refer to the costume of the background at any given point in time. Initially, this will refer to the purple one. Set the mode to ground and score to 0. Also, show the score variable. Now, check when a new message called tick is received. We'll broadcast this from the player later on. Switch the backdrop accordingly and increment the score. Great, onward to the player. After init, clear the effects, switch the costume to the ground player, go to the coordinates and then point rightward. We'll create some variables for the player to aid with the movements. These will correspond to the Y velocity the X and Y positions, and whether the player has already jumped off the ground. Accordingly, set the Y velocity to 0, the X and Y positions to be their current coordinates, the has jump variable to yes, because, well, at this point, the player is still in the air. You can think of the X and Y variables as referring to an extended set of grid coordinates, of which the screen is simply a part of. The movements will be made on this larger grid, and the scrolling will control what part of this larger extended grid will be shown on the screen. Now, create a block called go to coordinates, making sure to run without screen refresh, just like all the other blocks that we will create. Here, we will set up a simple scrolling script in the x-axis. We won't be scrolling about the y-axis at any point, so, well, this will do. Great. Now, create a block called player engine. This will move the player rightward by 8 pixels. Check if the mode is in the ground. If yes, we will use a new block called the ground engine. The final checks for ending the game are if the invisible or visible obstacles are touched. Onward to the main script. Here, loop until the game is over. We will use the player engine and adjust the scrolling so that the player is always visible on the screen. Additionally, we will limit the scroll X variable towards the end of the level so the player can finally move rightward to the ending animation. To coordinate this with the other sprites, broadcast, tick, and wait. Let's go the ground engine. Switch costume and bump up the Y velocity when the up arrow is pressed, only assuming that the player has not already jumped. We can add some basic gravity and then do a bigger jump when we do hit a trampoline. To simplify the code, we'll create another block called Y Engine, placing it after this. Check additionally if the finish line is touched, in which case the game must end with the player winning. Okay, what's left is the collision with the floors. Change the Y position according to Y well and rotate clockwise. Go to coordinates, then check for flow collisions. Obviously, while the player is on a floor, it must be in one of these four directions, basically a multiple of 90 degrees. So we just round off the direction to the closest one of these numbers using this particular script. If the player is not touching the ground, then he is in the air and is jumping. At this point, the player might be under the ground, in which case he needs to be brought back up. 
To be under a flow, the player must have earlier been traveling downward with a negative y velocity. If it's positive, we can detect a death by ending the game, and if it's negative, we need to bring it upward until it no longer touches the floor, stop further movement, and also enable the jumping once again. Great, testing the program now shows that we have a wonderful jumping motion. So far, the flow is stationary, so let's get it along with the visible and invisible obstacles to move leftward. We're going to be using a lot of clones which have to be deleted each time we restart the game. So within repeat 1, we add the script. Hide, then switch the costume, and then create a variable called clone for the sprite only, and then x for the sprite only. Set clone to yes and x to 0. Repeat 16 times, each time creating a clone, incrementing the costume, and then changing x by 480. On receiving tick, we just have to move the clones to the left. We'd only want the flows that are within the purview of scroll X to show and the rest to hide. We use 500 instead of 480 to create a small margin of error. Furthermore, we increase the size and decrease it after showing to avoid certain fencing errors along the stage borders. That's all for the flows. The code for the visible obstacles is quite similar, so we can drag and drop the sprites into it. Similar to the player, create a block called go to coordinates with an input of the x coordinate. Go to the location, and if the sprite is at that x position, show, otherwise, hide. This will fix some of the overlaps around the screen corners. For the tick message, we can just go to the scrolled coordinates. The same code can be dropped into the invisible obstacles with just one minor change. Clean up the scripts and just set the ghost effect to 100 at the beginning. This makes the invisible obstacles, well, invisible, and they can be used for collision detection even while they are no longer visible to the player. Great, now we have the entire level working along with the jumps. And the game ends too, although the music does go on. That's okay, we'll fix this later. Let's now move on to the trampoline. We've done the player movements already, and all that must be done here for the clones is to go to the right locations. First, remove the ghost effect and switch to jump 1. We'll have the trampolines engage in a simple animation of these four costumes. The trampolines will also have Y coordinates. There isn't really much to explain about the logic of these placements, except that I think this is where they'd work best. You can customize this if you want to change the locations slightly. You should have 6 clones, and the clone variable set to no at the end. Add the y variable in go to coordinates, and it's time to create the trampoline animation. We will need a variable for this, called trampoline countdown, so initiate it to 0 at the start. We increment this for the sprite, this way the variable increases only once each tick, because this script will not apply for the clones. The clones themselves, which are visible, will just switch to the costume every 6th tick. This way, we get a reasonably paced animation. Onward to the coins. We can remove the costume setting as well as the countdown, instead just creating a variable called touched. Basically, when a coin is touched, we'll increase the score by 50 and then have a small fade out animation as the coin moves upward. Once again, we need to modify the x and y values according to the grid, just setting the clone variable to no at the end. This done, create a variable called max y for the sprite only. When a clone is created, set its max y value to its y position plus 79. Now get rid of all the trampoline stuff, instead just checking if the coin has not been touched. If the player is touching it, we update the touched variable and increase the score as well. If it has already been touched however, we will just create a simple fade out script while the y position is less than that of max y. Once this animation is over, just delete the clone. That's all for the coin, we can now move on to the flying change sprite. Drop the three blocks there and tidy them up. We no longer need a touched variable and we can remove the conditions and animation as well. The other private variables can be deleted too. Okay, we just need two clones, the first at x 4900 y0 and the second at x 2750 and y50. If the player hits the sprite, we need to change a bunch of things for the player, so broadcast a new message to do this. We increment the background color as well to change the scene 
and also switch the mode to whatever it is not. Finally, delete the clone so this whole thing happens just once. Next is the finish line sprite. This is just a straight line that will detect if the player has won the game. Since it's a single sprite, we don't need any of the clones, but we will make it transparent. The X coordinate of this will be 6950, and we can simplify the remaining blocks, also making sure to delete the unnecessary variables, as this will be all that is required of the sprite. Nice, let's move on to the darkening sprite, which is purely cosmetic and very simple. This will just stay above the floor and give a night theme effect. Super, super simple, so let's just move on to the background. We have here a single costume, and we will need this to scroll across the screen in a continuous manner. Here's what we do. We'll create a clone, position it at the center, and then move the sprite itself out of the screen. We'll move both of these objects leftward until one of them is completely outside, and then we'll move that all the way to the right. This can just go on again and again and again, creating a seamless animation. Back to the code. After init, we'll delete the existing clone, go all the way back, and then show at the center. This will be the clone, and the sprite needs to move all the way to the right. To avoid the fencing problem, we use the size trick before moving. Now, after every game tick, the backgrounds can both just move left. We have to remember our condition, and when the background is completely outside the screen on the left, we move it by 960 pixels all the way to the right. And this is it. Testing the program will give you the awesome scrolling background, along with the trampolines, the coins, the flying portals, all in position. We are now ready to program the player death and the level restart when that happens. After exiting the loop, we check if the player has won or not. If not, we play the death sound, hide the player, and then broadcast a series of messages in succession. For the animation, we will have two things simultaneously fade out. The first is an expanding circle, and the second is a set of small cubes moving in all directions. Together, these give the impression that the player has basically exploded into pieces. To restart the game after this, just broadcast in it, and then start game. And that's all for the player. For the explosion at the start, we will make it translucent but not fully transparent and then hide. After the player dies, we move it to that location and furthermore, during each death tick, we bump up the size and make it fade away. Finally at the end, just hide. Let's move on to the player remains. After init, delete all the existing clones, then hide and then create the clone variable to distinguish between the sprite and the clones. We'll use 20 clones for the part of the animation and make sure that this clone variable is set accordingly. When a clone is created, we'd want to randomize a bunch of the attributes. This will include the size, transparency, direction, and even the individual velocity. You can try modifying each of these values a little bit and decide if that makes the animation look better. Okay, after player death, each of these clones need to move to the player and then show themselves. During each death tick, the clones just move in the direction that they are facing while fading out. Finally, after the animation is over, delete all the clones. Great, let's test this out. Oh wow, so smooth and wonderful. And the music resets too. We're already getting close to a full-fledged game. Let's fix a few small bugs and then work on making the ship mode function properly. Within the flows at the end, set clone to no. If this is not done, we'll have some funky things happening towards the end, the same being with the visible and invisible obstacles as well. Great, getting back to the player, we have to switch the variables after changing the mode. Set the Y velocity to zero and then create a variable called flying direction, setting it to zero as well. This will measure the angle with the x-axis rather than the y-axis. After this, disable jumping and point rightward. Also, change y by 5 so that the new costume is not inside the floor. Alright, we now need a block for the air engine that will be responsible for the moments when the mode is flying. This will be a bit long, but the logic is simple. First, switch the costume, 
and then go to the new coordinates. We add some basic gravity and also boost the velocity when the up arrow key is pressed. We limit the y velocity to an absolute value of 10 in either case so that it's not moving too fast and then change y by the y velocity. If there is a flow collision, set y well to 0. For the flying direction, set it to be the inverse tangent of y well divided by 8. This is really just basic trigonometry and will give the mode a great feel. Since the flying direction is the angle with the x-axis, we point in the direction 90 minus that. The algorithm for the flow collisions will be as follows. I recommend pausing after seeing the complete code script to understand the logic. To find out whether it's a ceiling or flow collision, we will move the player slightly upward. If there's still a collision, we know that it's a ceiling collision, and thus we move downward until the ceiling is no longer touched. However, if there is no longer a collision, it must have been a flow collision. So we can move downward by some margin, and then upward until the flow is no longer touched. And well, that's the flying engine. This really does look beautiful as we whisk through these obstacles. But till now we haven't programmed the particle trail for either the ground or the air. Let's do that right away. After init, we must delete all the existing clones, hide, and then create a variable once again to distinguish the clones. We will need 15 of them. Just set the clone to no after everything is created. Great. Now create a block called reset clone. We'll need this repeatedly so it will save some time. Whenever a clone is created, we will just use this. Now on receiving player death, just hide. For the block, go to the player and then check the mode. For the ground mode, the trail should start at the bottom left. Compared to the center, this is negative 20 on the x-axis and minus 10 on the y-axis. We will also point it leftward with some degree of randomness. Also, the particles should only show when the player is on the ground, that is, when he hasn't jumped. Let's go through the flying mode. Here, the trail should start at this exhaust. However, this is complicated by the fact that the sprite could be inclined, so we can't just change the x and y positions. Instead, we face the direction of the player and then move negative 20 steps in that direction. We can turn this normally and move downward to finally get to the pipe. Next, show and then turn again to point immediately outward. We'll give a buffer variation of 15 degrees, so there will be some randomness within the spray. Like the player remains, each particle can have a velocity with some variation, so let's add that in too. Lastly, we'll create some transparency with the ghost effect so that the trail is a little bit more realistic. Great. Now we must configure the movements of the clones after the tick message. Based on the mode, we will switch the costumes to either the blue or white particles. Each time, just move well steps and slowly fade out. If a particle is sufficiently far off from the player, with a margin of say 70 pixels, we'll just hide and reset the clone. And yep, that will sort out the particle trails. When we switch between the flying mode and the ground mode, the darkening must alternatively hide and show. Furthermore, the costumes at the beginning and the end of the flying mode need to change their color accordingly. For the darkening, this is as simple as showing and then hiding when the two backgrounds are shifted. Now, go into the flows. Here, we can just program a simple exception. In the second background, the costume which had a number of 7 becomes 7.2 and in the third background, the costume which is number 12 becomes 12.2 and that's pretty much it. If you test the program, you should have the output working for both the ground mode and the air mode. All that's left now is the ending animation. Head back to the player to program the last else condition. The objective will be to slowly move the player to about this coordinate. This can happen in 20 ticks, so we'll just calculate the distance between these two in both the axes and divide them by 20. Unlike the player death, the ending will have a different set of messages. The first repeat signifies the first animation, and the second one, along with the other messages, will clear the screen and fade in the end screen. 
On receiving end tick, the player just has to move towards the ending coordinate, have some rotation and a light fade. That's it for the player. Now, you have to just go to each sprite after this, except the last four of them, and hide them when the end game message is received. Little bit of work, but the logic is simple. After all, we are just transitioning to the end screen. For the player particle trail alone, we hide during end tick because we wouldn't want this to be visible during the first animation. And that's it for the particles. For the end screen, initially, it will be completely hidden and transparent at the center. After end game, just go to the front layer and show. It will still be invisible at this point because the sprite is transparent. But after each tick, we can make it more and more opaque so we get that fade in effect. Great. Now for the play again button. Initially, it will just be at this location and hide, showing itself at the front layer when the show play again message is received. The game needs to restart when the sprite is clicked and it's very simple to do. Just broadcast in it and then broadcast start game. Almost there. The last thing is the thumbnail. When the green flag is clicked, this will be hidden at the center. Furthermore, we will always reset the timer. Next, when the timer's count is greater than say 0.01, .01, go to the front layer, hide the score variable and then show. Basically, this is a stop button detector. The timer will only rise above this threshold when the stop button is pressed, giving us the thumbnail right at the top. And yup, that's it. The end screen animations work just as intended and now you should have a fully functioning geometry dashed level. Everything after this is up to you. With the fundamentals out of the way, you can customize your obstacles and create the level of your dreams. With that said, thanks for watching. Make sure you leave a like if this helped you out and until next time, peace out.